Hi, everyone. It's Darren and Christian, and we just wanted to interrupt your summer a little bit. We've had a number of people ask us over time for just some examples of some of the transactions and trades that we've done in some of our models. And so what we thought we'd do is take you through a few uh, as, an, as an illustration of kind of how we think. Um, I'm going to put a link up here to our kind of investment philosophy video, which gives you the you know 50,000 foot bird's eye view of how we think about investing. But we thought today we kind of dig into some specifics and go over a few trades that we actually implemented in the last while, just so you can see kind of what we were thinking, the information we had at the time, and how those worked out. Because I think they're illustrative of how we go about doing investing. Uh, because as you know, almost every account we have is a discretionary account where we kind of drive for you. So we'll maybe just show you how we're driving. Uh, and in the spirit of transparency, we're going to show you a couple that maybe haven't worked out quite as we hoped that they would. So um, we're going to call this thing, uh, Christian, you wanted to call it investment selection review. I think it's winners and losers, but we'll go with yours. So that's good. So welcome, Christian. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me, Darren. Excited to uh, go through this with everyone. So this was a great project, I think, because I asked you to go back over some of the trades that we did and just kind of highlight a couple. Um, I should also mention that a lot of our trades are often driven by a research department telling us what to do. And I sometimes listen, most times I do, sometimes I don't. But these were ones that we originated the, the trade rationale. There was research that we'd read, but we actually decided on our own to implement it. So I think they stand out as ones that are kind of unique to what we do and to our clients. So let's dive in. Uh, so first of all, we'll start with uh, a word from our lawyers. So uh, two out of three dentists agree and objects are closer there than they appear. Okay, so thank you very much. You can freeze frame that and watch it later at your convenience. So let's talk about a few that we looks like we got right since we did them. So Christian, do you want to take us through the first trade that we did uh, and, and talk about kind of a little bit why we did it and then what happened since we did it? So this is within our, our cross-border model, which focuses on cross-listed entities between the TSC and the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, we had Shopify in that model for quite a while. And in May 2023, following its most recent earnings report, it had appreciated about 30%, which meant that it was up 70% year to date. And after evaluating the entity, which certainly was quite volatile, if you look at its performance history over the last couple of years, uh, we felt it gave us a nice opportunity at that point in time, given the recent run up to diversify exposure away to other areas within the portfolio. And specifically, uh, we landed on looking at cross-listed energy entities. And as a brief rationale for why we looked there and what we landed on, which as you can see here, were Synovus and Suncor, uh, one, we felt that we needed some more energy exposure within the portfolio to act as a natural hedge against inflation. Uh, economic research obviously uh, indicates a very strong correlation between uh, inflation and oil. And so that gave us one aspect of the portfolio that we felt we could heighten. And broadly speaking, at the time of Im implementing the trade, uh, we felt that oil and gas prices were fairly well supported at their levels in May of 2023. And that entities within the sector could benefit from current levels of oil as well as uh, further price appreciation if it were to happen. And so our research led us uh, to two entities within the Canadian oil uh, sector, and that was Synovus and Suncor. And to date, we can see that the price appreciation has been quite favorable with an approximately 34% delta between uh, Synovus and Shopify and approximately another 19-20% uh, between uh, Suncor and Shopify. And not only has there been good price appreciation, but these are also entities that are generating significant free cash flow and they're growing and paying their dividends, which has been a staple for a number of companies that we selected over the years. I thought this was uh, also a good example of kind of how we sometimes go against the grain a little bit. I learned in high school, you know, popularity isn't everything. Uh, that's how I describe what I went through. Anyway, um, enough about me. This isn't therapy. But uh, the Shopify, when their numbers came out, were very glowing. And as you said, they, they'd had a lot of volatility. So it was a real kind of boost of confidence to the business into the stock. And I think many investors would have looked at that as a sign to buy because, hey, we got some good news we should buy or we should keep holding. I took it the other way and I said, actually, this gives us a chance to, I think, exit um, at, a, at a nice valuation surprise that we had. So as I say, when most people looked at the, uh, the, the earnings report, they decided to hold or buy more. I took the opposite and said, we should exit. And I much preferred um, increasing our, our allocation to the energy sector for the reasons that you shared 
And, uh, and, and it looks like we're still going to be right, I think, because um, everyone's still talking about inflation. So uh, that trade worked out really, really well. So we exited one of the biggest tech companies in Canada uh, and, and it allocated to energy. And so far, we've been really ahead with both of those, which is nice. Now, someone may say, uh, well, why didn't you just pick one over the other, the energy trade? I've, I've, I got it mostly right, and that's really the trick. So buy low, sell high, and we did that. So um, that was a good example of that transaction. Let's look at one that's um, uh, on the U.S. side, because that was a Canadian example. Let's give a U.S. example. So we've alluded in the past to our, our Dirty 30 and Dirty Dozen models. Uh, and so that's mainly U.S. listed entities. And specific in this case, uh, it, it, we reach a similar point with American Express where We've held this name in our model for several years. Uh, certainly, American Express had benefited quite a bit from the excess savings coming out of the pandemic and a lot of built-up demand for travel and entertainment spending. Um, it had reached a point where the multiples and its price targets were seemingly uh, reaching an inflection point in our view. And so we were looking at that time to diversify away from American Express and seeing where we can get additional allocation specific to AI trends and, and some technology. And Microsoft is a name that we've held within the pooled fund. And we've also held within our equity income model. And naturally, we were quite bullish on the fundamental strength of Microsoft. It's an entity that has significant free cash flow again, a strong balance sheet, grows and pays its dividends, but it also had significant exposure to secular trends such as AI. And so we felt that this was the right entry point to exit American Express and enter Microsoft. And to date, it's also done quite well in terms of the difference between the two trades where we're up approximately 13%. And uh, we're quite confident in the future prospects for Microsoft, given some of those secular trends, as well as the underlying strength of their core business. Well, I should also add here that we, we benefited from having a lot of clients that are in the tech business, and many of them had been kind of telling me positive stories about uh, Microsoft's lead in the AI space. Uh, so we listened to that, and fortunately, we got in and increased our position in Microsoft uh, a little ahead of everyone else getting, I would almost argue, overexcited about AI. Uh, as it turns out, that seems to be the slot machine that everyone's pumping more quarters into this year. Uh, so we got that one, I think, mostly right, which is great. Um, the other thing I was a bit concerned about is, uh, you're right, there was all this pent-up savings in the pandemic and Amex and Visa really kind of benefited from people shopping again. Uh, I am a little bit worried that the focus on um, credit card fees and things that has uh, certainly been um, more in the news is really probably going to hit Amex a bit harder uh, just because they are definitely a premium card and many merchants won't even take it because their costs are too high. So that was one of the other reasons that we exited. It looked like a little bit weak there. Um, in the short term anyway, and thought the trends are kind of not in their favor, but they're very much in Microsoft's favor. So so within the, that particular model, that also worked out to be a pretty good transaction. Uh, let's look at um, uh, another one in our pooled fund. These are actually some new investments that we were pretty early, I think, to add. And you just maybe want to explain what these uh, premium yield shares are, please. Yep. So these yield shares, uh, we allocated in January 2023 as a complement to our existing equity positions of uh, Amazon, Apple, Tesla, and Alphabet, which is Google. And essentially what these yield shares do is they write a cover call strategy on the underlying share. Uh, and that's a way to generate yield from the existing volatility of the underlying equity positions. And Darren, I'll go to you in a second because I know you've been a long proponent of these cover call strategies within uh, many of our models. But essentially, we saw this as a way to add a little bit of downside protection to our existing exposure within these names, but also uh, generate distributions within our pooled fund uh, to provide a uh, stream of constant income. And today, we can see that in, in three out of four instances here, the yield shares have outperformed the underlying equity name they're generating a yield of at least 7%. And we've had presentations in the past where we've discussed the significant outperformance of what's now been coined as the Magnificent Seven. And so I think this really evidence is that we have been participating in, in some of the upside and some of the mega cap names that we've seen to date. And this offered us a really nice avenue to do that. Yeah, so we've been, uh, or I've been a big fan of the covered call ETFs, covered calls. And we, I think actually when we go back to school in the September and the kids go back, I think I'm going to relaunch Coleman Wealth Academy and we'll do a little 
uh, overview of what the what this strategy is because it's a very old strategy uh, which is designed to reduce risk in portfolios, reduce the risk of owning uh, common stocks, uh, and drive a high income out of owning those shares. And we've been using that strategy predominantly using ETFs because it was a very easy and effective way for us to do that. And it would be on a basket of companies. What was new is that Purpose, we've got a long standing relationship with Purpose, they came out with that strategy and did them on individual securities for us and did it at an institutional rate. So, very cost effective. Uh, we were one of the first people to really have that brought to our attention um, amongst advisors of Canada. So, uh, and only Canadian advisors can use this and Canadian clients can use this. We cannot use this for our US clients, but be that as it may, uh, I really thought this was an interesting idea for us to reduce the risk of owning these more highly volatile stocks and also get a high income out of them. And one of the unique features of this strategy is that the more volatile the underlying security is, the more income it creates. So it's almost like um, a wind ribbon that creates energy. The more it vibrates, the more income it makes. And look at Tesla as an example, where you can see that um, Tesla doesn't pay a dividend, but because it has so much volatility, with this strategy, we're actually getting a 14% yield on it uh, based on the yield this, uh, in August. In a moment, I'm going to put up the uh, disclaimer from Purpose with all this stuff for our legal and compliance people. Feel free to freeze frame it, read it at your leisure. Uh, but this has actually turned out to be a really good transaction. So we're getting, I think, the participation in those shares as they've gone up, but done it in a much more kind of risk-adjusted way, which I, which is what really appeals to me. Uh, and we we're very early adopters of these. So, um, so that's worked out to be uh, not a trade so much as a new idea, a new way to approach how to invest. And we were uh, early adopters and adding it in. So it's really been to our benefit and our client's benefit to do that. So, okay. So those are ones where, hey, it looks like I'm smart. looks like we're smart. There's the disclaimer. Feel free to pause that. And moving on. Uh, so uh, let's show a few that maybe we got a little less right. Okay. So in terms of transparency, we never get them 100%, but let's just talk about a couple where maybe they didn't quite work out the way we hoped they would. And that's because the world has been a little bit tricky to gauge. So uh, Christian, take us through kind of the first one, which are longstanding favorites of ours that have really kind of struggled this year. Yeah, so we've, as you mentioned, had longstanding exposure to financials and real estate sector. Uh, certainly a lot of those entities are, are value-oriented, uh, pay high dividends. They're exposed to areas of the market that we've liked. Uh, but year to date, they've certainly detracted from the performance across uh, several of our portfolios. And really, if we're looking at starting with the financial sector, uh, we can see the shaded area here on that chart is representative of the uh, start of the banking crisis when SVB collapsed on, on March 10th, 2023. And that has had a significant impact on financial sector performance in both the US and to a lesser extent, Canada was affected as a proxy of that. Uh, so certainly this sector faced some headwinds there. Uh, we do remain confident within the larger names within the US sector and certainly within Canada. And so those holdings remain a staple within our portfolio. And to a lesser extent, we're also seeing within the banking crisis in the US, those concerns have largely subsided. Uh, metrics such as the bank term funding program which was initiated by the U.S. Fed in response to the crisis. We're seeing many uh, fewer banks using those programs now than in the immediate aftermath. So a lot of those concerns seem to be easing, and especially along the CIFIs, which are the strategically important banks in the U.S., um, those concerns are not as prominent. But nevertheless, um, it has been a detractor to performance year to date. And the other sector that we have been affected by is our, our real estate exposure. So broadly speaking, real estate and, and similar to some other asset classes such as technology in 2022, uh, there are what we would categorize as long duration asset classes. So they earn cash flows over an extended period of time and they're measured based on the earn rate of those cash flows. So they get discounted back to present day and that's how you arrive at a reasonable valuation for those entities. When rates rise, and especially as quickly as they have, uh, the net present value of those cash flows get reset based on those higher rates. And certainly that has impacted the real estate sector quite significantly. As we're seeing here, the relative performance of the sector has been quite poor year to date. And so this is another area that we felt was necessary to highlight, given that we do have some underlying exposure uh, within our portfolios, 
It is also worth mentioning that within real estate, there's a number of subsectors. And so you may have heard across a number of news articles concerns over the office uh, subsector within commercial real estate. Uh, we're quite cognizant of our exposures to those areas, and we have very minimal exposure to office as an instance. But that type of concern has painted broad strokes across real estate, and it's also contributed to some of the negative underperformance. Yeah, so historically owning real estate, being a landlord has been aligned to what we do, and that's actually paid off well over the years. You know, by um, really high quality real estate, be a good landlord and your rents keep going up and collect. Uh, and we love owning the banks. You know, as Butch Cassidy says, that's where all the money is. Uh, and especially in Canada, that's been a great thing to do. But both of those sectors have come down for their own reasons, but also because they have something in common, which is they're heavily tied to interest rates. So that has been really the place uh, or the rationale, the reason that that's actually hurt those sectors as hard as it has. And and, uh, and part of that is because um, if you look at where rates were, where they are now, and also the guidance from the people pulling the levers has been a bit interesting. So do you want to take us through this slide, Christian? Yeah, so uh, I found two quotes that were quite poignant uh, around 2021 from the respective uh, Bank of Canada governor, Tiff Macklem, who's on the bottom, and uh, Fed Chair Jerome Powell. At, in 2021, so this was coming out of the pandemic, uh, we've talked about the significant uh, fiscal measures enacted to support the economy. In conjunction with very loose monetary policy, rates were cut to near zero right at the precipice of the pandemic. And so these two individuals who lead uh, the central banks in Canada and the U.S. Uh, described inflation as transitory. So what that means is they were we anticipating inflation. We know they don't watch my Walking inflation. with Charlie. They, sorry, we, we know they don't watch Walking with Charlie because I told everybody that it wasn't going to be transitory. But what can I do, Christian? Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Uh, it, it, if they would have, I don't know if we'd be in the same situation we are now, but uh, nevertheless, they had felt that the large portion of inflation pressures uh, would subside on their own without the need for significant monetary intervention, uh, which in other terms would mean a significant rise in interest rates. And the way that I wanted to show this is just at the end of December 2021, and this is three months before what would be 10 consecutive interest rate hikes in the U.S., including several 75 basis points interest rate hikes, the Federal Reserve, and this is their committee voting, so all members of the Federal Reserve, uh, they release a dot plot uh, at each of their meetings. And in 2023, they had projected rates to be in the realm of 1.5% to 2%. By 2024, they had thought rates would be around 2%. And how accurate they also are released... they? All, how close are we to yeah. those, Christian, right now? Yeah, so in Canada, our prevailing interest rate, Fed funds rates, is 5%. Uh, in the U.S., uh, we are now at 5.5%. And so not close. And we are actually not even close to their error range that they say is possible when they make these projections. So... Uh, not only have interest rates increased much higher than they forecasted, uh, the pace of those increases has been much higher than they forecast. And as you mentioned, certainly when we're making decisions about sectors exposures, uh, that has had an adverse impact on real estate. Uh, financial entities, the, the whole rationale behind the SVB collapse was because of their duration management within their asset and liabilities, and they were affected by the pace of those rate increases as were other financial institutions. And certainly they may even be affected by some net interest margin normalization as well. So uh, the central banks were very wrong and transitory is not a word that you will find in the vocabulary nowadays. It seems to be gone, doesn't it? So, uh, so yeah, this is exactly why it's been so turbulent for industries that had a high correlation interest rates. So they told us it wasn't gonna go up. They weren't gonna raise interest rates. Um, and then when they did, it would follow a glide path. It looked relatively gentle. Inflation was, they got all of that wrong and they didn't even double interest rates. They've increased them by more than 20 times. So a little tricky to, to manage things when even the people pulling the levers don't seem to know exactly maybe what they're doing in some cases, but we'll hope for the best. Um, and maybe we've seen a bit of a plateau in this, but we will see. Um, 
let's go to another one that um, had similar factors, but I think is a little more uh, specific as a real estate investment we allocated to that um, just, I think, through timing more than anything else has really underperformed our expectations. So I think we should maybe just explain kind of why that is and what we're trying to do about it. So we hold uh, the firm capital apartment read within our pooled fund. And as you can see, since about the beginning of 2023, um, it's underperformed relative to its uh, nearest index, which is the iShares uh, Residential Multi-Sector Read Index in the U.S. Uh, broadly, as we just mentioned, the real estate sector has underperformed given those rate increases. So the uh, extent of the negative underperformance um, has been quite uh, poor. And we've had a position within this firm capital apartment REIT since uh, 2018 when they had their initial offering memorandum. And it had performed quite well uh, up until 2022. We were collecting a steady stream of income from the REIT, but it was quite adversely impacted by not only the pace of those interest rate increases, but as well as certain idiosyncratic risks relative to their um, portfolio. And they had specifically um, properties within Northeast US that um, because of COVID had several tenant restrictions enacted on those properties and they could not turn over their portfolios and benefit from higher rents. And so that's detracted from quite a bit of their performance relative to even their own industry. Uh, we recently met with management in June of 2023, and Darren, I'll give you an opportunity here in a second to speak to uh, our relationship with Firm Capital over the years, and, and not only um, how their other products have performed for us and have done quite well, including the MEC, but as part of our meeting with management, we wanted to reaffirm uh, how this was going to be rectified, how the performance was going to improve over time, where the direction of the entity was headed. And uh, not to get too granular, but essentially um, we wanted to confirm the accounting of their properties and they're going to be liquidating a good portion of this portfolio, which they've disclosed within their quarterly filings. And the nav of the underlying uh, share right now is about $9.30 uh, per their latest filing. So as part of our conversations with management, we wanted to see is $9.30 actually going to be achieved? Is this a reasonable figure uh, to extract from the underlying por pro uh, properties? Um, is there a path to recovery? Uh, we came out of those conversations quite confident that they were carrying those properties at the correct values, that there was value going to be extracted from those properties and they would be able to strategically reposition. Um, in many of those cases, uh, if we look at the accounting standards, just to quickly go to my uh, home background here just for a second. Uh, the way that you want to be valuing it is at fair value. And because they are selling these properties, in many instances, they're actually valuing at the sale price. So we're quite confident in what they're listing within their financial statements. And we're also quite confident based on our discussions with management that they'll be able to utilize those funds to help reposition the entity. No, this is good. There's a lot there to unpack. So um, just to summarize uh, from our conversations with management, when they launched this uh, investment, I was a, a player in how to get it to get uh, operates. We were in right at the very beginning of it. It made a lot of sense to allocate to uh, high quality rental real estate in the Northeast United States. Um, it was a great idea. And even now, you know, I think that's a smart thing to do, except we had this little thing called COVID. Uh, if you're watching this from Florida, you're going to have to Google what that was because you don't know. Uh, but basically, the, the world kind of shut down. And in those jurisdictions, the, t the landlords could not raise rates and they couldn't evict anybody. So you had a bit of a perfect storm for landlords in that, you know, your cost of capital surged, as we just talked about interest rates going up. Uh, you couldn't increase your rents and you couldn't evict people who stopped paying you. So all of this was suddenly a nightmare scenario. Um, one of the benefits of us having a long relationship with firm capital, and this is something I think is a real priority that that in times like this proves itself is having access. Uh, so we had a very good one-on-one uh, -on -one conversation with Sandy Polklar, who uh, manages this product at Firm Capital. Um, I've also done a number of podcasts with Sandy for a trade association. I'm going to link, I think in the description, I can link to some of those podcasts that we've done over the years if you want to dig into this a bit more. Uh, and Sandy and I just did one about two, three weeks ago. So as soon as that one's published, we'll make sure people can find that one too. Um, but 
this is where, because we have access to them, uh, we were able to get, I think, a very good eyeball to eyeball conversation of what's happening, which went beyond what's in the reporting in terms of our comfort with it. Uh, and Christian, I think it demonstrated, you know, your background and, and the strength that you bring to our team, being able to uh, go through the financial statements and really look in all the corners and all the cracks and ask Sandy um, some really, really good questions to give us comfort with the data that they're giving us. So at the moment, the, the security is trading at about half of the net asset value. So given that we have comfort that they should be able to exit some of the properties and sell them, we should get a lot closer to net asset value. I think the right thing we do is just be patient and wait it out. So um, that's what we're going to do. And because we have that access to Sandy and uh, we're pretty comfortable with their strategy and you're right, they've been very smart with other investments we've had from them. So we kind of look at this as a unique situation and um, we'll just let them. So not everything works as people know. So, um, but I think that's a good example of one that didn't work, but I think we've done the best we can and um, we'll just try, hope for better on that one. So I think that is really the highlight of, uh, of the show for today. So um, Christian, thank you very much for putting all those graphs and slides and charts together. That was great work. Uh, for those of you uh, who stayed with us for the last 26 minutes, thank you. I hope you found this helpful. Uh, if you did, just drop us a note and let us know if you'd liked it. Um, Christian and I are happy to do these from uh, time to time throughout the year, just to give you a little more awareness of, kind of what we do and how we've done it. I feel like, you know, you're at the mechanic, we'll just walk you under the car and uh, show you a little bit about how it all works. Um, and just, again, to give you a little more trust and confidence in uh, what we do for you every day. So Christian, thank you for your help in putting that together and uh, more good works ahead of us, isn't it? Happy to, and uh, have a great summer, everyone. Looking forward to reconnecting. Thank you. Bye-bye.